Hello, quarantined mathematicians. Welcome back to our video lecture series. This one's about the Laplace equation, probably the most applied differential equation of all time. Except for the harmonic oscillator. That thing's everywhere. To start, let's review the Laplacian differential operator. It is defined as the sum of all second partial derivatives with respect to spatial independent variables. The Laplacian has been present in all the differential equations we have studied up to this point, most notably the heat and wave equations. You should recall from Calculus 1 that the second derivative of a function describes the curvature or concavity of the graph of the function. The second derivative of a function tells you if the function is tending to increase or decrease depending on its sign, just as the sign of an object's acceleration tells you if it's speeding up or slowing down. Then the Laplacian of a function, or the sum of its second derivatives in all the spatial variables, describes how the average value of a function in some small area around each point compares with the actual value that the function takes at that point. Think of yourself walking along some landscape where the function f of x and y describes your altitude. When you are at the top of a hill, all points in a neighborhood around you are lower than you are then the average altitude surrounding you is smaller than the altitude where you are standing, and the Laplacian at that point would be negative. Similarly, imagine you were standing at the bottom of a valley. There's nowhere to go but up. The average altitude in any small region containing the point you were standing is therefore larger than your current altitude. The Laplacian at that point is therefore positive. Now imagine that you were standing at a saddle point or part of the terrain slopes upwards, but an equal amount of it slopes downwards. You could choose to go up or down, and if you take a random step, you are equally likely to increase as decrease your altitude. The Laplacian at such a point would then be zero, and the average altitude around you would be the same as your current altitude. The partial differential equation, known as the Laplace equation, is defined based on this latter case where the Laplacian of a function is zero at all points in its domain. A solution of the Laplace equation is therefore a field where the average value in a symmetric region around a point is always equal to the value at that point, at all points in the domain. This is known as the average principle. Equivalently, for a field satisfying the Laplace equation, you can always go upwards the same amount as downwards, no matter where you are standing. This means that there can be no critical points, no local maxima or minima, within the domain of the solution. This also implies that the largest and smallest values that the solution takes must be on the boundary of the domain. This is known as the maximum principle. As a quick aside, who do you think first defined and applied the Laplace equation? You guessed it, another dead European guy. This is Pierre Simon de Laplace. There's tons of stuff in math and physics named after this guy, so try not to get too confused. He is sometimes referred to as the Newton of France because of the sheer depth of scientific contributions that he made. But I'd bet that he thought of Newton as the Laplace of England. Back to Laplace's equation. This differential equation pops up in so many places that its solutions have their own name. Functions which satisfy the Laplace equation are called potential functions or sometimes harmonic functions. They are so common in physics that a whole field of research popped up in order to describe their properties. The field of potential theory has entire books written about functions that solve the Laplace equation. Why are these things so popular, you ask? It's because they show up in practically every scientific field you can think of. Here's a brief list of physical systems that the Laplace equation is known to model. There's gravitational fields, electromagnetic fields, the velocity profiles of fluids, steady-state heat distributions, the shape of soap films hanging from wires, and the displacement and stress fields in solid elastic bodies. This barely scratches the surface. The beauty of the Laplace equation lies in the fact that once you solve it for any of these cases, the solution more or less carries over to all of the others. For this reason, it has been described as a kind of mathematical Rosetta Stone, used to decipher the language of nature. When Laplace first solved his equation for use in gravitational physics, there's no way that he knew the depth of the applications that would stem from it. 
that last application listed about elastic solids, it's pretty close to my heart. My dissertation was about applying solutions of the 3D Laplace equation to determine the elastic fields in shallow foundation systems resting on sand. You might add that one application of studying the Laplace equation is getting some extra letters after your name. The Laplace equation also pops out of a problem that we've already studied. We have discussed that Fourier invented the Fourier series in order to satisfy a boundary value problem for the 2D heat equation. This figure here is straight out of Fourier's original book from 1822, although I added the flame emojis. The system varies with time. However, after some long time period, the system will reach a steady state, or final temperature distribution. This can be achieved mathematically by taking the limit as t goes to infinity. If the temperature stops changing with time, then the derivative with t goes to zero, and the 2D heat equation becomes the 2D Laplace equation. This is actually the assumption that Fourier made when he began his analysis. Under the interpretation as a steady state heat distribution, this boundary value problem models a rectangular solid with insulated edges, the bottom of which is kept at zero degrees, while some arbitrary heat distribution is applied to its top. This corresponds to zero Neumann boundary conditions at the boundaries x equals zero and x equals a, a zero Dirichlet boundary condition at y equals zero, and a non-zero Dirichlet condition at y equals b. What will the final temperature distribution be in the solid? The 2D Laplace equation is separable, and so we proceed again by separation of variables. Hopefully you guys have gotten used to this method of analysis by now. We have two ODEs with respect to x and y respectively. Each has three possible forms of solution. The boundary conditions specify which of these solutions is viable for our problem. In this case, the Neumann conditions on x yield a constant solution, as well as an infinite family of cosine terms corresponding to each non-zero natural number. The boundary conditions on y yield one linear solution and a family of hyperbolic sine terms. We can therefore set up a general solution in terms of an infinite series, which we can make converge to our remaining non-zero boundary condition at y equals b. For those of you confused by the hyperbolic sine term in the preceding solution, let's do a quick review of hyperbolic trig functions. In essence, these are the functions you get if you try to define the common trigonometric values using a hyperbola instead of a circle. The hyperbolic sine of a value a is equal to half of e to the a minus e to the minus a. The hyperbolic cosine is equal to one half of e to the a plus e to the minus a. We see then that the solution of the ODE in the last slide, which normally consists of exponential terms, can easily be rewritten in terms of hyperbolic sine and cosine terms. We choose these forms here because they make it easier to satisfy boundary conditions in finite regions since hyperbolic sine of 0 is 0, and hyperbolic cosine of 0 is 1. Returning to our boundary value problem, we see that we can determine the coefficients of a Fourier cosine series in order to satisfy the arbitrary boundary conditions at y equals b. We are left with a single coefficient, a0, along with infinitely many coefficients, a n, corresponding to each non-zero natural number n. Let's run through a quick example. Assume that the boundary temperature at y equals b varies linearly from 0 to a. This corresponds to selecting the function f of x equals x as our boundary function. The Fourier coefficients can then be easily calculated using methods seen in earlier videos. The solution for the steady state temperature can then be written as an infinite series. Taking a large but finite number of terms, we'll be able to plot the surface corresponding to the temperature on the rectangular domain. We take a and b equal to 1, resulting in a square domain of unit area. Plotting the result from the first 100 terms in our Fourier series, we see a visualization of the temperature distribution. The boundary condition at y equals 1 clearly holds, as the curve varies linearly at the boundary from 0 to 1. 
the zero boundary condition at y equals zero is also captured. Looking at the surface inside the domain, it is clear that there are no local minimums or maximums in the temperature distribution. So the maximum principle holds. At every internal point, the solution's Laplacian is zero. It is also worth noting that while we analyze this problem under the interpretation of a steady state heat distribution, our solution is applicable to any of the other physics problems where the Laplace equation is applied. This surface might be an electromagnetic field or the shape of an elastic membrane. Let's move on to a classical problem of the Laplace equation known as the Dirichlet problem. Keeping with the rectangular domain, the Dirichlet problem consists of prescribing general non-zero functions across the entire boundary, or in this case, four functions at each of the sides of the rectangle. How can we go about solving this problem? Remember that the Laplace equation is a linear differential equation, and therefore the principle of superposition holds. Applying this principle, we can split the Dirichlet problem into two much easier problems. In so-called problem 1, the solution U1 has the required values on its y boundaries, but zero values on its x boundaries. In problem 2, the solution U2 takes the required x boundary values, but is zero on the y boundaries. The function U, equal to U1 plus U2, will satisfy all four boundary conditions, as well as satisfy the Laplace equation, since the sum of two solutions of a linear PDE is also a solution. The solutions of problem 1 and 2 will each work out to have a neat Fourier series solution so that the boundary functions can be satisfied no matter what they are. I will leave any further analysis of this problem for your homework. I'd hate to give you all of the answers. After all, the joy is in the discovery. Thank you for watching this video about the Laplace equation. It really is my favorite differential equation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. See you soon.